I just want to say thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to be here and just stand in this pulpit on what happens to be one of my favorite times of the year. Um, I guess the reasons are obvious. It's Missions Week 2024. Welcome to Missions Week 2024. This is a special time in the life of our church where we are able to just step aside and kind of just see what God is doing. And this year, we are really highlighting how God is moving and working and how you can get involved in our local missions. As we seek to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening in Memphis and beyond. Now, I want to begin this morning by just asking, asking a couple of questions. Uh, I want to ask you and those of you that are joining us online, I want to welcome you as well. And we are excited that you are here. But here's a question for you. How many of you in the room would say that I am a native Memphian. That means that you were born, raised, and still live in Memphis. Raise your hands. Let me hear your pride. All right, I see that. All right, that's good. Now, how many of you would be what I call transplants? That means you moved to Memphis for some reason or another, and just somehow it stuck, and you're just here, and and you love it. Raise your hands and let us hear your pride. Amen. Awesome. I'm glad to hear there's some, uh, uh, some pride for the 901. Uh, I myself am a transplant as well. Uh, I moved to Memphis in 2006. So transplant describes my family perfectly. I want to tell you just a little bit about my story because I think it helps frame what we're getting ready to walk through in the scriptures. The Lord called me to full-time ministry in 2006. And as soon as he called me into ministry, I knew that I needed to be trained for the work that he had called me to. And through various things, the Lord led me to the seminary that's right across the street, Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. So in August of 2006, my wife and I, we moved to Memphis. And we said a lot of the same things that you said when we looked at Bellevue. We will never go there. It's just too big. Big. <laughs> And I moved across the street into seminary housing, and I said, you know, it's just too big. I came from a church where there was a staff of one uh, and uh, didn't know that churches like Bellevue existed. But one Sunday, we said, we'll just give it a try just to kind of see what it looked like and what it was like. And as we went, we enjoyed it. And then we stepped into a side of a life group, and lo and behold, we met somebody that we graduated from high school with. Isn't that crazy? Now, when you hear where I'm from, there'll mean even the more craziness. I am from a small town in East Tennessee called Saudi Daisy. Anybody ever heard of it? All right, I like that. We got some Saudi Daisy pride going on. Yeah, I moved and we instantly, at that moment, had a connection. And then all of the sudden, this big church became small. When me, Ashley and I moved to Memphis, we had really uh, no jobs, uh, no kids, and not a clue as to what we were doing. And since 2006, through God's miraculous provision, I can tell you that now we have three children, a wonderful home, and a church family that we deeply love. God is good. I have served on staff here at Bellevue since 2006 in some form or fashion. And 13 of those years were a part of serving and leading our local missions ministry here. I love Memphis. I have seen God move and work in most every zip code of our miraculous city. I love Memphis. But if you've been at church here for any time at all, you know what? Bellevue what? Bellevue loves Memphis. It is more than a slogan. It is more than a ministry. It is the heartbeat of our church. When you look at our mission statement, it's clear. It says, love God, love people, share Jesus, and make disciples. It's not, you cannot find a more biblical mission for a church in anywhere in the United States. I mean, it comes straight from God's word. When you look at the values of our church, 
That's the heartbeat, the DNA of our church. Local missions and our focus for the community that we live are all in it. We have the value of what we call intentional hospitality. Welcoming everyone, everyone with the love of Jesus. We have our heart's desire for everyone in Memphis to know that they are loved and we want our church to look like Memphis. But not only do we have this value of intentional hospitality, but we have this value of city renewal. Investing in the redemption of the people of our community. At Bellevue, we strategically invest not in buildings, not in programs, but in people. It's who we are. But why do we do that? Because we long to see a day where the vision of our church becomes a reality, and that is where we become a catalyst for spiritual awakening in Memphis and beyond. That's who we are. That is our heartbeat. What would it look like if that spiritual awakening began in me and it began in you and it spread from Memphis to the ends of the earth? And I believe that the cornerstone of how we look outward begins in our Jerusalem. This morning, if you want to turn to your Bibles to Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, we are going to read verses 1 through 14, but focus in on verses 4 through 7. The title of our sermon today is Live on Purpose. Live on Purpose. To follow Jesus is to have purpose. I love how the Westminster Confession, the Catechism, I love how it answers the question of purpose. It states that man's chief end, man's chief purpose is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that comes from a number of scriptures, but one of those scriptures is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Does that define your life? Is that all that you do? Everything that you do? Think about your last week. Is everything that you did within the last week, could you say that it was done to glorify God? That's our purpose. That's why we exist. And Jeremiah 29 gives us insight on how we are to live on purpose right now, where, right where we live. See, Jeremiah, he prophesied during what is known as the divided kingdom era. King Solomon, who ruled during Israel's most peaceful and prosperous time, eventually turned his heart from God to the worship of idols. In response to this great sin, the Lord tore the kingdom from Solomon and he divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now the northern kingdom fell quickly into idol worship because of bad leadership and poor kings and prophets. And immediately, almost, the Assyrian army came in and took them out. Now, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. They did not fall into idol worship as quickly because they had some good leadership and people that were pointing them in the right way. But eventually they did fall. And God would use the Babylonian kingdom and Nebuchadnezzar to end the southern kingdom. And take exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so where we're at in the book of Jeremiah today, it's a letter from the prophet Jeremiah to the exiles that are in Babylon Let's look in Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 1. 
It says, now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priest, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the court officials and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan and, and Jeremiah, and the son of Hilkiah and Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. And I have sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word in you to bring you to back to this place. Verse 11 is, is a key verse and it's one that we all know. And it, it's just a unique that it's in this context. The Lord says to these exiles, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to this place from where I sent you into exile. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray now that you will bless the reading of your word. And Lord, I pray that as your servants, that we will say, as the prophet Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In your name I pray, amen. This morning I want us to dive into this text and I want us to really look at four realities that I believe that we must understand and internalize if we are going to truly live on purpose. The first reality that we see from this text is this. God sovereignly ordains where his children live. God sovereignly ordains where his children live. Look at what it says in chapter, verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts. There is no mistaking who the author of this letter is. Yes, Jeremiah is pinning it down, but it is the word of the living God. And the exiles are listening to the words of God as they hear this letter read to them. This letter is addressed to all the exiles. So far, two groups have been exiled to Jerusalem. And these Groups included religious and political leaders, craftsmen, and other skilled individuals. Now this next phrase in this verse is so interesting. It says, to all the exiles which I have sent into exile. Who is writing the letter? Tell me. You can say it out loud. It's okay. God. God's writing the letter. So if I sent them into exile, who's I? God. So we have to understand this. See, God is the one who sent the exiles to Babylon, to that pagan, pagan idolatrous city. It is by God's ordained sovereignty that he put them there because of a consequence of their sin. He did that. So that his purpose could be fulfilled 
in their lives. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't the Babylonians. It was God who sent them into exile. See, God uses circumstances and situations to move his children where he wants them. The Lord has a purpose for where he sends his children. And that he had a purpose for the exiles and he has a purpose for you today. You may be in a situation where you have no idea why you are where you are. Please know this. God knows why. And he is sovereignly in charge and he ordains where you live and he ordains where you are at this moment. God sovereignly ordains where his children live. The second reality is this. God commands his children to live where they live. I know this sounds silly, but go with me, okay? He, he, or, he commands his children to live where they live. Look at verses 5 and 6. Build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. God was telling the Judean exiles to settle where you are. Build a life for yourself. Because you are going to be there for a while. Later on in this text, we see how long they're going to be there. Seventy years. They better get ready for a couple of generations to be in Babylon. Each one of these verbs that are found in this text are commands, not suggestions. Build, live, plant, eat. Take wives, become fathers, take wives for your sons, give your daughters to husbands, multiply, do not decrease. These are commands. The grammar tells us that it's an imperative. That means there is a command to follow. Now, I believe that for the children of Israel, for the exiles that are here, it would have been difficult for them to hear this hard truth. That they are to live where they live because of where they came from. And I believe that sometimes it's difficult for us to live where we live for a number of reasons. First, we have a tendency to romanticize the past. We remember where we used to live and how good it was. And to be honest, in 2006, when we made the trek some six hours from East Tennessee to West Tennessee, there were a couple of times where I missed the mountains and the valleys of my home. <laughs> it was, I was like, Lord, why did you move me to this part of Tennessee? <laughs> Trying to navigate and walk through that. And it was hard. Our first couple of, of years here, we didn't know anyone here. We did not have family here. We left everything when we left uh, East Tennessee. And it was hard to settle in here. So sometimes we romanticize the past, but sometimes we focus in on the future too much. Many people come to Memphis and it is just a, a stop in their journey. Like they're planning to come for school, get educated, get started in business and move away. So they never really settle in Memphis because they're thinking about what's next. And I believe that that's what the children of Israel, the exiles, struggled with. They thought about Jerusalem and how great it was. And they thought about that day when they would return. And I'm just telling you, for us, for Ashley and I, Memphis was a pit stop in our journey. It was only supposed to be three years and gone. And he, the Lord, in his sovereignty made it a landing spot for life and ministry. And we learned how to live where we live. Bellevue Baptist Church, I want to encourage you to live where you live. If you have been too focused on living in the past or too focused on living on the future, start living where you're at. God sovereignly ordains his children where they, uh, where they live. He commands his children to live where they live. Thirdly, we see that God commands his children to invest where they live. Look at verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Now, 
Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Now, when you hear the word investment, some of you just checked out. I don't have anything to invest, so I'm good. I'll just skip and wait till it gets to point four, right? But I want you to understand that when we look in the economy of God, each and every one of us have something to invest in the place where we live. I love this word here that says seek. Seek is another one of those commands. So we don't have an option on whether or not we need to invest in where God has placed us. We are commanded to. But what are we supposed to seek? The welfare of the city. Seek the welfare. That word welfare is the Hebrew word shalom, which is peace. We are to seek and invest in the peace and the prosperity and the hope and the goodness of the city where we are. That's what God had for the exiles. Now imagine how foreign this would have been to those exiles. You want us to seek the welfare of this pagan and idolatrous city? Why would we do that, God? It goes against everything that we stand for. And some of us struggle investing even in the welfare of our own city. Now, this is a command. And I don't believe God would give his children a command that they're not able to fulfill. You would not do that for your children, and I don't think God does that to his children. So how can we, as a people, invest in this city? How can we invest where God has placed us? I believe this, one of the greatest, if not the greatest ways to invest where you live is the outward expression of your inner faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want that to sit for a little while. Think about it. An outward expression of the inner faith that you have in Jesus Christ. When we begin to show the world who we are in Christ... By our words, by our deeds, it makes a difference in the community where we live. It makes a difference in our family. It makes a difference where we live. Think about it. We have to begin to see how our faith in Jesus impacts the people around us. So when we talk about investments, a lot of times you hear about this term, this acronym, ROI, right? Return on investment. What is the return on the investment of us living the way that Jesus calls us to live? I think Jesus sheds light on this in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse thir- chapter 5, verse 13 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, in the first century, salt and light were two precious commodities. Salt was used... To what we use it for, to season things. But more than that, back in the day when there was no electricity, there was no refrigerators, it was used for preservation. And really, if you think about it, to preserve something means to slow down the decay of something that is dead. So salt did that for individuals in the first century. Light does what it does today. It dispels darkness. The outward expression of our faith in the place where God has put us is going to slow down the decay of sin in the world around us. It is going to dispel the darkness of the enemy when we start to show our our light. So you have to begin to understand the role that you play. See, many times... I believe what happens here, there's a great multitude of believers who shine brightly when they come to church on Sunday that hide their light when they go out into the world Monday through Saturday. 
It is easy to stand up and sing, I am not ashamed of the gospel, right here. Right? But when I take the next step on Monday and I'm in the cubicle beside me and I see a lost person that needs to hear Jesus, all of a sudden, my lips grow silent. Are you here today and your light shines brightly here on Sunday? But when you go into the marketplace, where you go into your place of business on Monday through Saturday, there's something that happens. Bellevue, if we are going to see this nation, our city, be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, our lights have to shine brighter outside than they shine in here. That's what has to happen. If you're going to see movement in our city, if we're going to take ground back from the enemy, our lights have to shine brighter outside. It is so true, but it is so hard to do because of fear that comes into us. But if we're not going to do it, who will? We must be willing to be salt and light where God has us. We must invest in the place where God has called us to live. And the fourth thing that I, fourth reality that I want us to look at today is this God commands his children to pray for where they live. Verse 7 again Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. To pray here means to intercede. See, a lot of times we use church words like pray and and intercede, but we don't really fully understand what that means. So I just looked up in Webster's Dictionary the word intercede, and it helps me out a lot. To intercede means, means to intervene between parties with a view to reconciling differences, to mediate. When is the last time you interceded on behalf of Memphis? God was telling the exiles to pray for this city of Babylon. And he is calling us to pray for Memphis. Because in its welfare, we will have welfare. And I'm reminded for years on Sunday nights, we prayed for Memphis. How many of you were here for those services where we would stand up and we would pray boldly for Memphis? There was a part of that prayer that I loved And it talked about how we wanted the Lord to bless the economy of Memphis. Listen to the part of that prayer. It says, Lord, bless Memphis's economy. Bring in godly, wholesome businesses to Memphis that will provide employment for people so they can provide financially for their families. Please help those who are able to work but are without jobs to find the right job opportunity so they can fulfill your command to work. We prayed that for years on Sunday nights. In preparation for today, I did some research on the internet. Here's three headlines that I came up with over the last couple of years. Memphis area recovers all jobs lost in COVID-19 pandemic, hits record high employment. 5,800 workers needed how Tennessee is helping to build Ford Blue Oval City's workforce. 5,800 jobs Experts are telling us within the next 10 years, the area around Stanton, Tennessee, just up the road, is going to explode with 90,000 new people moving into that community. Another headline said this, the Memphis Medical District is really growing. What's next for the area? Here's a quote I found on uh, wearememphis.com. The Memphis economy is a freight train filled with employment opportunities and fueled by people building their careers by being a part of something special. God answers prayers. Let's not think that those times that we spent on Sunday evening praying for Memphis, that they were empty words because just a quick look 
shows that God is moving in the economy of our city. And I believe, I'm just crazy enough to believe that it's not just how impressive our business people are in Memphis, but it is the power of a holy God that loves his city and loves to hear his people pray for Memphis. That's it. God answers prayers. God is calling us to pray for our city. God sovereignly ordains where his children live. God commands his children to live where they live. God commands his children to invest where they live. God commands his children to pray for where they live. Now based on the truths of this text, I want us to consider three questions. Three questions, and I'll go as fast as I can. First question is this, so what? So what? What does this mean for us today in 2024 at Bellevue Baptist Church? John 17, 16 and following. I'm going to read just a portion of it. I love what verse 18. This is a prayer of Jesus for the disciples. He says in verse 18, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them. And then verse 20 says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. Jesus was praying for us. Because based on what the disciples did and their faithfulness and them after them and them after them and them after them, we are here today. We are to live as a sent people. And because we are sent, these truths that we have talked about, these realities that we have walked through, are for us today. That's the so what. Second question is so how. So how. How are we to do this? How are we to live on purpose? When we talk about the how in missions, you have heard us said, say many times, this is how you need to get involved in missions. Y'all, my, if you want, feel free to re- repeat after me. Pray, give, and go. Anybody ever heard that before? We're going to do that. This is our application for today. We must pray. What are we to pray for? We need to pray for the lost. We need to pray for the billions that have no hope in Jesus Christ, that we need them to know Christ. We need to pray for laborers. We need to pray for more laborers to come into the harvest field. Jesus said the fields are wide into harvest, but the laborers are what? Few. We need to pray also that those laborers that are already on the field, thousands of church planners with the, I, with the North American Mission Board, thousands of missionaries with the IMB and other organizations, our Mid-South Baptist Association, all of those, we need to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray that the Lord would show you how to respond to today's message and begin to live on purpose. We need to give. Give through the World Missions Offering this year. It will go to help fund our mission work greatly in a mighty way. And we need to go. We need to go and live on purpose. As we look at our mission strategy, we really have highlighted locally three areas. Cordova, Compassion Ministry, and Churches. I want you to watch this video and learn a little bit more about the work that's going on in Cordova. When we think about where our church gathers every single week, you know, you have to ask the question, have we ever tried to reach the people that drive by our church campus every single day and see the three big crosses, but have never like stepped foot into our building or maybe even interacted with anyone that's a part of our church? And when we were looking at ways to get involved in our city, we realized this school, Dexter K-8 school, is the access point to hundreds and really thousands of families. So it really started out in in one of the most simplest ways of, hey, we came in and we were doing landscaping, we were doing mulching, but it really opened up the door for us to have trust uh, with the school. Our middle school team has like always been very involved with schools like Arlington Middle School, Lakeland Middle School, and others. But we really felt burdened with our own community right here in our backyard. Doing sports, games, fun activities, snacks and lunch, and then also the most important thing, 
they get to hear the good news of the gospel. We originally started Dexter Day as kind of just an opportunity to build out our JLM and BLM projects. We started to notice that out of our Dexter Day, we were building connection with students and teachers that we weren't getting in our one-on-one -on -one settings, in our settings with the school. It definitely is going to impact their motivation to wanting to do great things and continue on their path to success. It gives them a reason to kind of want to be at school and look forward to opportunities of being in a different environment. They know our faces now. I can walk into the school and instead of you just seeing a face that you're kind of like, hey, I kind of know your name and I've seen you around, it's a relationship. Since partnering with Dexter, really just our view on what it means to minister to local schools has shifted. And so I think of teachers that have reached out to me and asked, how can I be praying for you? The relationships are being formed and that it's opening doors for us to be able to have deeper gospel conversations. And it's so easy for us to think of a school as an institution, but in that school are people people that are made in the image of God, people who are in sin and that need to hear the gospel. And so when we look at the partnership with Dexter, it's really a communication between us and them of, hey, these are the needs that our students are experiencing. Some of them are lonely. Some of them are going through difficult times. Some of them need school uniforms and school supplies. Some of them need tutors because they're not quite getting the reading levels. But then we also have various times where we're going and we're serving teacher appreciation meals. Or we're going and we're dropping off cookies or writing them notes of encouragement and being creative with the ways of saying, hey, we as a church love you and Jesus loves you. I think for people that might be apprehensive or think that this is something that they're totally not equipped for or might think, well, someone else will do that. It reminds me of the story of Moses and how he did not want to say yes and he just felt so unequipped. He didn't know what to do and really wanted for the Lord to choose someone else. But all that the Lord needed was his yes on the table. I think we underestimate what the Lord can do with just our obedience to say yes. You know, for us, what I'm hoping to see is that one day when we go to Dexter K-8 school, we see not families that we don't know, but families that we know because they're a part of our church. Because we started out with the Dexter day and they came and visited and they felt comfortable, they felt loved by our church. They heard the gospel, they gave their life to Jesus, and now they are in that school being faithful witnesses amongst their friends and their community. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Just, just in case you're not fully grasping the context, those students were coming on our campus during the middle of a school day. It was a reward for them because of the good work that they had done in class, and they got to come here during the middle of a school day and experience the love of Christ. Amen. But the work is not done. Over the next couple of weeks, we're hoping to start an after-school program with, along with Arise to Read. We need help at Dexter K-8. through We need you. Cordova is a harvest field that we need to reach. I often ask our team, if Bellevue was to close the doors, would Cordova miss us? And we are doing the best that we can to make sure that if that ever happened, that they would miss us. We want them to know that Bellevue is here and loves them. So we have Cordova ministry, but we also have compassion ministry. Compassion ministry is the ministry to the least of these. We think of the widows. I think about Don Russell and our car care ministry and many others that kind of work with him that will faithfully help minister to the widows of our church and the single moms of our church that have no help. We think about the refugees. Over 2,000 refugees have come into our city over the last few years. This is a picture of a, a soccer game that was here where about 13 different nations were represented on our campus and they were able to engage in fun and hear the gospel. Orphan care. We need to love the orphan of our community. There are some 1,200 children that are in state custody in Shelby County alone. We have an orphan care ministry that wants to walk alongside adoptive 
and foster parents. If you are here today and you are adopting or walking through adoption or fostering, we have resources to come alongside you. I would encourage you to go outside these doors and find our orphan care booth. And they have a gift for you and they want to meet you and help you. We also have ministry to churches. Our Christian Mobile Dental Clinic goes out every week. I think about Jim and Dickie. They, they drive this bus week in and week out, and they need some help. What they do is they take this to a church, and it sits at a church, and it becomes an evangelism tool for that community. We use that every patient that comes on that, uh, that clinic hears the gospel. They hear the gospel, and they respond, and then those contacts are given to that church for them to follow up. I think about what we do during the summer through Mission Memphis. We have vacation Bible school opportunities with these churches where they're able to engage and hear the gospel. And we can help churches in our community that aren't able to do those things for themselves or just help them, help them along the way. So that's the how. I could really go on for another 30 minutes, but I, I won't. <laughs> the last question I want to answer is this. So why? So why? Why should we live on purpose? Because God has commanded his children to live on purpose. If you are here this morning and you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you must wrestle with and understand the realities that we have learned are for you. Listen to these realities with a you put in it. God has sovereignly ordained where you live. God has commands you to live where you live. God commands you to invest in where you live. And God commands you to pray where you live. Now, if we're careful, if we're not careful, we focus more on the you than the first person that's mentioned. And that's God. He's the one that empowers us to fulfill these commands. He's the one that has placed us. It's not on you. It's in the power of God that is in you. Listen to this. This is beautiful. Billy Graham said, We are not cisterns made for hoarding, but we are channels made for sharing. A cistern is basically a hole in the ground or a barrel that water flows into and just sits. But a channel allows water to flow in and then flow out so that water can be used again. Sometimes we here at Bellevue have a tendency to become a cistern. We have all of these great resources, and we want everybody to pour into us and pour into us. We have another Bible study. We have another thing to do. We, can, we, just, cut and we just sit here, and we get filled up. But we don't allow it to flow through us as channels of living water to a lost and dying world. Don't allow yourself to be caught in that trap. Do not be a cistern, but be a channel for God. 